Mark, uh, Mark, please don't forget to email us the scores after the session. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Mark uh, Pilkington. I'm a fellow of the British Blockchain Association. I've been involved uh, almost since the uh, the inception. So uh, just let just a few words about myself before introducing the speed today's uh, this session's uh, speakers. Uh, so I am currently based today in uh, Albania. I'm an associate professor of business administration uh, at uh, Epoca University in, uh, in Albania. Uh, before that, I was uh, associate professor of economics in a French uh, university. I'm actually, I actually have a dual citizenship, French and, uh, and British, so I was uh, teaching economics. There, I'm also a founding member of uh, the Center for Evidence-Based Blockchain. I'm an uh, associate editor-in-chief of the Journal of the British Blockchain Association. I hope I'm not forgetting anything. So today we're having a very uh, interesting uh, session with uh, four speakers. Um, so before we, I don't know if I would should say a, a short word about each one of you. Uh, first, and then uh, I'll actually start with our very first speaker, and then I will. No, it's okay, Mark. You don't need to introduce yourself. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so I'll let them introduce themselves. That would be uh, that would be uh, more more suitable. Uh, I would like to begin this session with our first. Oh, by the way, before we start, I just want to say something. I just want to say something to Dr. Nassim if we have time. That um, I was very very grateful for his uh, talk on the uh, uh, UK national uh, blockchain uh, roadmap. Actually, Dr. Nassim was appointed um, a honorary professor uh, at Epoca University in Albania, where I work. And uh, he has already delivered a few lectures uh, to some of my students. Uh, my bachelor's students had a great lecture, which actually was a very, very similar topic on the UK uh, national roadmap. I think it was uh, two months ago. And my uh, MSc students in uh, business administration also had a very, very interesting lecture taught by uh, Dr. Nassim. And I think if I remember well, it was on evidence-based uh, uh, research, uh, blockchain research. So I'm very grateful that we are um, uh, joining today on, uh, online for this uh, uh, annual uh, event, the International Scientific uh, Conference. And uh, so just a, a few, uh, a word of thanks to, to all of you, to all the participants. And I really look forward to this uh, session this afternoon. So our first speaker is, uh, if I remember well, Professor Christy. Uh, sorry again for your surname, uh, Judith? Judith? Judith, sorry uh, for the, the, the pronunciation. Who, yes, um, who is based, if I remember, in, uh, in Portland. And uh, who's going to, yeah, do we have here? And uh, who's going to uh, talk about the NFTs, uh, the metaverse and the environmental uh, benefits? Uh, Professor uh, Yudis, would you like to um, introduce yourself very briefly? And uh, uh, yeah, so the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Mark. So this is Jelly, Jesse yes. Dillard, my colleague, and I'm Christy Yudis. So I was the founder of a blockchain program at Portland State University in Oregon in the US. And we are in our third year, but this is the first time that we'll be teaching a metaverse course. So we're very excited about that. We've been doing a lot of thinking about the metaverse, um, NFTs, metaverse, and the environmental benefits, because we hear so much about the environmental damage that blockchain can cause, and in particular, Bitcoin, proof of work finding, and that sort of thing. So we wanted to create a framework for thinking through the potential environmental benefits as we make this shift toward the metaverse. So the metaverse, we can think of as a series of online environments that are synchronous and persistent and give users a sense of presence, of being there in the world with or without a set of VR headset on. Um, there are centralized metaverses that are very familiar to many of us, Second Live, Fortnite, Minecraft, Roblox, where Dr. Nassim's daughter spends a lot of her time, and then now we have many decentralized metaverse worlds being developed. In particular, you may have heard of Sandbox and, uh, and Decentraland. 
Now, what is distinctive about these metaverse worlds is that they use NFTs. So what are NFTs? They can be thought of as digital certificates. And these digital certificates can be digital natives. So a JPEG, for example, of a piece of artwork, or you can have music or concert tickets that reside completely online, or they can be digital twins. So they can be a, a digital representation of something physical. So a digital car title, for example, or a replica of Paris Hilton's yacht could be a digital twin. Um, in the metaverse, NFTs have been thought of as a game changer and the killer app that really is going to make innovation in the metaverse explode. And we're seeing that happen already. Um, th this is because NFTs allow ownership, portability, and most importantly, monetization of these digital assets. And so that really leads to a lot of new economic and business models being developed in those worlds. Uh, in 2021, $25 billion in NFTs were traded and 28 million wallets were uh, holding NFTs. So do NFTs and metaverse hurt the environment? And yes, of course they do. They require a lot of energy. They require tech equipment. Um, but our research question was, can they deliver environmental benefits? And what is the kind of framing that we can use to think through what those benefits might be? We used a design science research method and our objective was to develop such a framework. We did a thorough review of the academic and trade literature. This has just not been discussed. There's a huge gap in the literature about the environmental impacts of the metaverse. Um, so we looked at environmental impact frameworks and all kinds of research and we took field trips in the metaverse to try to understand what's going on there. And then, so we created this framework, which I'll show you, and then we'll demonstrate how it works with the fashion industry. Here's a simplified version of our environmental impact framework for decentralized metaverse. At the top, we are thinking about how we replace what's happening in the physical world with the digital world. So we can replace physical objects and physical activities with digital ones. And then on the bottom, we're thinking about how that spills over and actually changes the physical world. So it can change our production and it can change our consumption. And here's an example of the fashion industry. So it is an enormously wasteful industry. There's a lot of environmental damage in this industry right now. A hundred billion garments are produced every year. One in five of those garments are never even sold. One, of, one in three that are sold aren't used. And the industry is responsible for 20% of industrial water pollution, 10% of carbon emissions, and 25% of all of the chemicals produced. So enormously wasteful. And a lot of development is happening in the metaverse for the fashion industry. So at the top here, we see some examples of how uh, physical things are being replaced. So uh, at the top, we see digital objects. These are clothing that you can buy for your avatar. This is a Gucci purse that sold for more in the metaverse than the equivalent Gucci purse sold in real world. Um, there are a lot of fashion related activities. We see a Gap store here that has no physical merchandise, yet we can buy an NFT there or we can buy a physical item that gets sent to our home. There's a digital fashion shows that we can attend and this uh, coming in a couple of weeks will be Metaverse Fashion Week. Um, and then, but more importantly, these things will change how we operate in the real world. So production can change enormously as a result of these virtual worlds. So you can see here a pop-up store and that store has no physical merchandise. So no shipping, no supply chain. This woman is standing in a scanner that allows her to see what she looks like in virtual clothing. She can try on that clothing. She could even take it into the metaverse with her before she ever buys a physical version. And so that version is never produced until after it is purchased. 
Um, and then here at the bottom, we see an example of how metaverse is changing the way we consume. These are digital outfits that we can wear in our Instagram posts, or we can wear them in our Zoom meetings, and we don't have to buy the real clothing, we can just buy a digital version. So what happens is that work and leisure are moving to the metaverse and blockchain and NFTs are instrumental in that move. And as you can see with just this one single industry, environmental gains, huge environmental gains are possible. So we really need some frameworks and some research to think through how this is going to evolve. And then once we get through the environmental impacts, there's a lot of work to be done in social impacts as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Christie. That was a fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you very much for keeping your, uh, your time slot. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. So I, I found your presentation extremely clear, extremely interesting, and I would say uh, balanced, you know, because we all know that very often the emphasis uh, tends to be on the, uh, the env environmental uh, damage, especially when we talk about uh, cryptocurrencies or more, you know, more generally um, blockchain uh, powered uh systems tends to be uh tend to be depicted as uh not so environmental friendly but it, in, in in this very short presentation you did convince me that it's not so much a, a black and white picture anymore but we need to look at both sides of the of the picture and that uh even though they might still exist some kind of uh activities that are detrimental to the environment there are also possibly some uh gains to be uh derived from uh from the metaverse and uh so yeah you did convince me uh, uh, uh about this uh now i have a one question about uh, about the metaverse because obviously it's the big uh big talk you know the, the big buzz right now i mean everybody's talking about the metaverse um when it comes to environment uh the the regulations tends to be very much uh, framed at the uh at the national level still do you believe that with the metaverse we are going to uh, uh, to be confronted with the similar issues that we have been facing for many for, for many years already with the blockchain uh, ecosystem in the sense of how do we how do we harmonize the standards how do we uh, how do we reach some uh, transnational uh, regulation uh, compromises or uh, do you think we're going to have very similar uh, discussions with the metaverse that we have had uh, with the with the blockchain for several years when it comes to the the, the most suitable uh, type of uh, regulation that is needed for this new and basically we're talking about a brand new world that is going to be uh, unfolding before our eyes so i just wanted to ask you what is your take on this question of uh, a regulation yeah that's a great question mark um, the very same problems that we have with other blockchain initiatives we have with these decentralized metaverse initiatives. They are placeless um, and they are sort of ownerless, you know, because we have so many participants potentially. And so it's, they're very difficult to regulate. Um, and this may not be as much of a problem with environmental impacts as social. And maybe you've heard some of these stories about um, people getting harassed in metaverse environments the minute they go in there women in particular start getting harassed so we need regulations for these things but it's a really difficult question to understand who is going to be doing that regulating especially in a decentralized world yes Another I, I agree research topic for the future yeah. I agree very much with you Christy it's a, an open question an open debate and very much one that we're going to come across again uh, within in, in the future. Uh, do we have other questions from uh, the audience or is that? Is no, that... I think Mark, we can move on. We can, we can move to our second. Yeah, yeah. So if I uh, remember well, uh, we're going to ask Dr. David uh, Kupsel, sorry again for my pronunciation if it's not perfect, who's talking uh, from, uh, he's, I think if I remember, he's uh, currently in Mexico City 
is uh, very much he operates at the junction between uh, startup business and uh, academia. Uh, David, would you like to say a few words about yourself, and then the floor is going to be yours for your for the for the second presentation. Please. Sure. Thank, thank you so much um, uh, for uh, the introduction, and, and that was a fascinating paper. Thank you um, for the uh, previous presentation. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm the co-founder uh, and uh, CEO of EncryptGen, uh, which is a genomic data uh, um, startup that we um, uh, founded in 2017. Uh, co-founded with my uh, my uh, wife, uh, Dr. Vanessa Gonzalez. Um, and I'm also a lecturer at uh, Texas A&M in the philosophy department. And actually, today's paper is mostly going to be philosophy. Uh, it, the, the presentation is, is built for uh, a non-specialist audience who has no, inf inf no prior knowledge of philosophy or um, of blockchain. I'm going to skip most of the blockchain stuff because uh, we have a, a blockchain-friendly audience here. So uh, I'm going to try to share my window here of my slideshow. This is a paper I've been working on uh, with um, <clears throat> Dr. Barry Smith, who has been my, um, uh, my uh, <clears throat> collaborator for about 25 years now. So um, this is about um, non-branching digital beings. And I'm going to introduce a, a, a philosopher's idea, uh, ideas about um, uh, identity here. Um, so a lot of this is philosophically centric. Uh, Derek Parfit um, uh, posited the notion of, of uh, digital identity and branching identities long before there were really any uh, um, uh, implementations in, in uh, the technology that we now have. So he posed the thought experiment, as philosophers do, about what, what would happen with personal identity if we could branch like amoebas, for instance. Um, you know, who would be the you in that case. Um, and this is, you know, this is a thought experiment of, this, of the kind that philosophers often come up with, but one that has become a lot more relevant, I think, in the digital age, and I'll address that. So you know, ordinarily, as we know, objects in the real world don't do that. Uh, individuals don't do that. Um, um, but in the digital world, it's quite easy to copy things, and, and we've been doing that for a long time. Um, exact duplicates of digital files can easily be made. Uh, we, we, you know, your, your own cloud storage di uh, duplicates uh, your unique files um, and uh, distributes them. Um, and, and so, you know, this, this notion of um, a branching identity is very applicable to digital beings already, has been for some time. Um, and in fact, that's one of the reasons we like digital beings, um, because it's easy to copy things, it's easy to move them around. Um, to make exact, perfect copies of digital files is uh, is relatively straightforward. So, it's um, it can be problematic too, um, given some of our pragmatic, social, and legal concerns of the roles and uses of originals as opposed to copies. Um, so, uh, an original birth certificate is, you know, so as a social object of, of significance, um, and it's an exemplar against which other um, copies can be judged for authenticity. It's usually centrally stored and authenticated, uh, and there's a number of um, legal norms built around the storage and authenticating of those sorts of things. Um, and the possibility of perfect copies in the case of digital objects re removes this grounding um, of original versus copy that uh, most of us grew up you know, at my age at least, grew up with with uh, an original birth certificate filed in a drawer somewhere and uh, guarded by somebody with authority. Um, now I'm going to, as I said, promised, I'm going to move past some of the um, blockchain stuff because that's really for people who don't understand much about um, blockchains, and you folks do. Um, but we'll skip ahead to non-fungible tokens, uh, which are meant to be um, unique digital objects. Um, and uh, non-divisible um, and uh, meant to indicate uh, and uh, ensure the authenticity of some digital being in, in a way that um, other sorts of digital objects typically cannot. Um, and, you know, so I wear a number of hats. I'm also a lawyer and I, I like to talk about um, the, the legal uh, norms around these sorts of things too. So NFTs actually can act like a sort of title. Um, now they're they don't have the legal status yet of titles in most jurisdictions, but in 
and uh, that certainly would be possible to um, use uh, NFTs or something like them uh, for cadastral registries of um, uh, land, for instance, and other um, cases where we use titles. Um, uh, and those old systems of cadastral registration are, are ledgers, actually. So it would simply be digitizing those old ledgers in, in, a, in a way that um, would make things a lot simpler and more uh, transparent. So um, Bitcoin is not computable. Ethereum is. Bitcoin is a single purpose distributed letter, ledger. It, it tracks really only um, Bitcoin. But Ethereum is a, is a different sort of blockchain that was built to be Turing complete, as we know. Um, and that and that's really interesting because it allows general purpose computation, uh, which is important for what I'm going to talk about next, uh, bringing in um, uh, Parfit's uh, ideas about branching identity. So um, Parfit posed this thought experiment about what would happen if you could split who would the you be. Um, but um, we can start to think about that as a as a you know somewhat science fiction, but eventual. Uh, uh, possibility if we could do a couple of things if we could do something like AI or we could upload our ourselves to the block to to uh, the cloud in some way so while NFTs are being used to distribute digital goods like uh, um, albums and books etc tickets to events um, we could consider given the nature of Ethereum as a Turing complete um, platform um, using this for this issue of general AI. So there's two issues with general AI. If we, if we were able to create artificial intelligences, um, you know, that there, there is a, the, the possibility, of course, that they could reproduce themselves. And then you have a philosophical question over which the which AI is which. Uh, do, do any of them have unique um, identities? At what point do they gain their identities? Again, these are somewhat philosophical, but also potentially um, um, practical questions. Um, but um, yeah, we think it's more likely that, you know, um, people will be worried about this if we could um, perfect something like, you know, brain uploading, which is, you know, in the distant horizon of, of possibilities, but uh, something that people are trying to build. Um, so if you could do that, you might not want to do that if you couldn't guarantee your unique identity uh, once you've uploaded uh, yourself um, to the cloud. I mean, if you can, if other people could um, reproduce you at will, um, then that might be an impediment. That might be a, a, a philosophical issue for you. It might be a moral issue for yourself that you could be reproduced at infinitum. Um, and there are a number of legal and other social issues uh, associated with that. So we think um, that... Um, the promise of NFTs, if they're fully realized, um, could uh, help to um, remove that hindrance, um, the threat of you know being split infinitely, um, and and give you some way uh, to create a unique, non-severable uh, digital identity for some sort of AI or uploaded human brain. Um, NFTs um, are programmable; um, they're supposed to be. Um, uh, Turing complete, so we could, you know, in theory, and there's a lot of computation issues involved with this yet, um, uh, realize any of the goals we could realize with general AI or brain uploading in ordinary uh, storage medium uh, uh, through uh, NFT platforms. So um, given, uh, you know, the elusiveness of, uh, of general AI, we haven't come anywhere close to it yet. Um, this is, I think, a distant possibility, um, but you know, philosophers are here to solve uh, problems, whether distant or uh, imminent. Um, and um, you know, I think there's a there's a lot to overcome for for any of this technology, um, and and we still have yet to see that NFTs are going to be completely successful at what they promise to do, as well. Um, but when they do. Um, branching identity, as described by Parfit in, in his various papers and books, um, um, the, the complications that it would pose for individual digital identity of, of conscious digital beings um, might be solved uh, in ways that uh, assure those who want to try to achieve this uh, or, um, you know, for us who want to try to protect the rights or, or a dignity of some um, eventual 
uh, AI, um, we might be able to use non-fungible uh, te te uh, token technology uh, to help to uh, uh, ensure non-branching digital identities of those sorts of beings, um, to ensure their uniqueness, um, and to um, create some sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, assurance for for those of us who might, you know, consider that in the future, um, that we're not going to be, um, you know, complicated in ways that uh, Parfit and others have, have already anticipated long before the technologies were around. So thank you very much. Uh, you can visit my website and learn more about my publications and, and uh, teaching uh, there. I appreciate your listening and look forward to any questions. Thank you very much, David. That was a fascinating uh, presentation. I enjoyed uh, every bit of it, every second of it. Um, there will be really a lot to say. Just one comment first. I, I really enjoyed when you uh, um, when you mentioned the uh, philosophical uh, underpinnings of your reflection, especially when it comes to uh, to general uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, in fact, in a way, it's very fortunate the the order of the, the of the presentations. I'm going to try to link up the two presentations, even though I think the first presenter, Christy, is no longer with us. But uh, uh, talking about the metaverse, which you're more focused, I think, on artificial uh, general AI, AI on, 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 on your, in your presentation, but I'm going to try to link up the two. Sure. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a human being in the, in the real world, at least I think so. And imagine that I project myself soon in a few years in the metaverse through some kind of avatar. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the, in the uh, metaverse, I found myself, or I'm found uh, guilty by a uh, let's call it a competent uh, authority in the metaverse, uh, of some violation of some law or regulation. Uh, Christy was telling us about uh, bullying, you know, harassment, which is a very sensitive issue at the moment. Um, are there problems uh, or the issues related to digital identity in the metaverse uh, going to be phrased in the same terms as they are uh, in artificial intelligence world, or do you, do you see any differences? Uh, and are NFTs something that are going to facilitate uh, the resolution of uh, problems uh, that are related to digital identity? So maybe my question is a bit very general, very broad, but uh, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on this, please, uh, David? So I, I generally think that a, a lot of our, you know, the, the legal and social um, norms uh, that we've adopted in the real world are going to have to be adapted significantly uh, for metaverse beings. Um, certainly, um, you know, the, there are issues of tra trespass and, and theft and assault um, and other sorts of violations that mimic those that we experience in the real world. Um, and as we become more accustomed to it, um, we're also going to have to, uh, you know, to, to life in the metaverse, we're also going to have to um, start to impose some regulations on on artificial digital beings and their behaviors as well. Um, you know, we don't want to see NPCs uh, committing, uh, you know, uh, crimes against uh, 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 those of us uh, who choose to spend time there or who have uh, in the distant future uploaded our digital selves to live there. Um, so we'll have to, you know, we'll, we'll, the code, the underlying code of our, of our legal and social norms will, will adapt itself, I think, uh, and we'll have to do that rather consciously um, to, um, you know, to ensure uh, that uh, people, peoples and entities and beings, lives and, and, and rights are, are valued and respected in, in similar ways in, in, that, in that digital realm. I hope that, that answers that no, it's a fantastic. It's a great answer, David. I actually, I really enjoyed to your your slide on the digital uh, consciousness. I pretty much agree with you. Everything you said about the need to update very much our regulation in the future, and the fact that uh, some uh, uh, some problems uh, that actually uh, link to uh, I don't know technological digital issues are going to be actually uh, very much linked to uh, human. Uh, human phenomena like such as consciousness. So we're going to have to perform a kind of uh, quantum uh, leap, you know, in terms of regulation, understanding, a refl reflection on a very, very much on our own uh, identity or our own uh, new emerging uh, digital world. And all this 
I think uh, foreshadows some uh, very, very uh, exciting uh, development. So thank you very much, David, for your presentation. Um, now, our third presenter, uh, Professor Melissa Appleyard, I think who is also based in, uh, in, uh, in Portland, is going to be our next uh, presenter. Uh, Melissa, I'm just going to give you the floor now, so you start your presentation, you can say a few words about yourself, and, uh, and, and as I said, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate being part of the session today. So I'm a I'm a professor at Portland State University with Krista Eustis, and I'm also the associate dean of our graduate programs. And it's been so fun to infuse blockchain in our curriculum. And Christy founded this business blockchain certificate a couple of years ago. And we're just having so much fun seeing in industry applications in, in addition to all the crypto, of course, work. Uh, my research started back in, well, long time ago uh, at UC Berkeley when I was working my PhD in economics that I was really interested in why bitter rivals cooperate in, in the semiconductor industry. And so I went down to Silicon Valley regularly and sat in on morning meetings and there's actually so much cooperation at the senior level, but the junior level engineers were all paranoid and didn't want to share um, between over company boundaries. But what I really have enjoyed when I learned more about blockchain is how it really allows people to cooperate so easily along a supply chain, for example, and that there can be a lot of shared benefits. And what this talk in this paper is about is trying to figure out how deeply could those relationships get? How close could you get? And what are the payoffs? And what Christy and I wanted to look at was in maritime trade, because I'm sure a number of you have followed what's been going on with Trade Lens, the joint venture between Maersk and IBM. And then there are a number of other carriers, other shipping companies that have joined that consortium. And so I'm really interested in why uh, they join and what the payoffs are. And so this is a preliminary examination of that. And we really would look forward to any feedback. And so just send me emails, um, appleyard at pdx.edu, if you have any follow on, if we don't get to it today. So let me go ahead and move on. So we know that blockchain holds great promise for business beyond cryptocurrency, but the adoption has been limited. And so why is that? We're just really wondering, you know, what are the elements of that? So we want to dig in in uh, industry study, maritime trade. And so what we find is that the complexity of organizational ecosystem interdependencies help explain why. So this whole construct of interdependence uh, and what that means and what levels companies have arrived at this really commingling of their operations is what we're trying to explore. Uh, so this paper really does explore organizational and um, strategic approaches to this collaboration. We present a framework for interdependencies, and then we contextualize in maritime shipping, as I said. And we are using a pretty loose definition of blockchain uh, that the transactions can be captured in immutable distributed digital ledger, as you all are aware. Now, maritime trade. I know it's been in the news a lot because of COVID and the fracturing of supply chains. <laughs> Has anyone tried to buy a, a car recently or a, a product that like a, a new iPhone or something that um, demands uh, the well smooth functioning of a supply chain? It has been hard. And so a lot of it is because there are just so many players involved and there hasn't been really clear tracking of how <clears throat> goods and services, well, goods flow across the different oceans. So it is a great candidate for open innovation. And I've done work in open innovation once with a colleague named uh, Henry Chesbro, who some of you might know. And it's like, what are the bases of uh, open innovation in terms of companies really learning from each other and cooperating? And in this industry, the relationships are really tight across the supply chain and pretty bitter across the um, different, so Maersk versus some of the other carriers from Asia and, and um, the US, that there's quite a rivalry. So how can we bring these different entities, the shipper, the freight forwarder, et cetera, all these different stakeholders um, to cooperate through a blockchain adoption? So as I said, you know, there's hundreds of years of established practice that we're trying to overcome in this cooperative landscape. 
And there are so many documents that talked about sort of two inches um, thick of documents for every uh, every product that is uh, every container that is transported across the ocean. And what's beautiful and the standards for documents and was alluded to in the last presentation, the legal ramifications of having a digital representation of ownership is still really being worked out. And so that's impeded the adoption of blockchain. But the blockchain enabled solutions at the bottom right, you, you know, it's this digitization of the trade documents can occur and has occurred in some instances. There's been a lot of experiments going on. Um, certificates of authenticity, uh, you're all aware of the execution of, you know, smart contract that you can have instantaneous uh, it, it, in terms of insurance is a great example. In maritime shipping, you can have a sensor in the container if the heat exceeds a certain level. And so, you know, the contents are going to be spoiled. You can have an instantaneous uh, execution of the insurance policy. Uh, then the precise tracking of containers, you probably have seen that all the pictures of the container ships backed up around ports around the world during COVID. And frankly, some container ships are not really understood where they are. Um, and then port traffic management, you want the trucks or the trains to be there right ready for when the containers are offloaded. So how do you get the supply chain all coordinated and blockchain is a great solution for that. Um, so there's a lot of great prior research. Many of you in this uh, at this conference have written it. I don't cite all of them, but there's just really great research out there. Our foundational observations for this paper is that the enterprise blockchain requires and creates interdependencies at both the consortium level, so the cooperation among, among the companies, as well as the broader ecosystem. And that would be like, say, the insurance companies um, or the trucking companies. So there's all these different pieces that fit into the ecosystem of maritime shipping. And so recognizing these interdependencies help identify level, uh, levers that can help overcome barriers and facilitate adoption. And Trade Lens, the IBM Maersk um, joint venture that then has been expanded beyond a JV to consortium level really has shown that. So great organizational theories in the background. And it leads to these interdependent organizations, what we're looking at, that they're linked through this integrated processes and systems that the blockchain has helped facilitate. And the co-creation of value is what we're really interested in. How do they co-create operational, strategic, economic value? And what Christy also talked about is what are the ecological implications, which are really huge because if you can not have ships idling in the port or you know outside the port, and you can have them just dock immediately and unload, that's a huge promise, um, a really big payoff. And the Port of Rotterdam, for example, is experimenting a lot with this. And the sharing of risks because of the the um, weather risks, uh, that it's become a big deal to try to figure out how to smooth risk. So uh, how we went about this is uh, we looked in the web of science and we looked at you know keywords, blockchain, adoption, diffusion, and uh, within a lot of subject categories and came across 156 papers. And of those, we identified 16 that were really pertinent to maritime trade and blockchain adoption and added five other um, highly relevant papers from the maritime tr um, shipping. There's a vast literature in maritime shipping, as you might be aware of, it's, it's really fascinating. And then a lot of like the World Economic Forum and a lot of other publications. Uh, so what we find are these independence, interdependencies really group into four areas, sociotech, economic, standards, legal, regulatory. And you already heard that in the prior presentations, how important these different areas are. Uh, in trying to figure out how it's going to play out over time. And we group them into this framework. I just circle or put a oval around some of the key areas for particularly pertinent to maritime trade. So in terms of the top two boxes, the economic sociotech can be under the consortium interdependency of the companies in the actual uh, group that's executing the blockchain. That this balance of participation benefits is huge, as you might expect, that like in this case, the trade lens case, Maersk is such a dominant player, there was really reluctance to have other carriers um, join. And so it's, it's fascinating that over time, a number of carriers have been able to join because they shifted their governance structure and made it much more transparent and welcoming to new players and shared, and shared the returns 
um, for, from Trade Lens that's now a subscription service. On the socio-technical side, it's this established relationship. And this is what was fascinating about the prior presentation when I'm thinking of social networks that's part of your branching, um, is how does blockchain either enhance or fracture the social network? And in this case, there's a lot of fracturing that's going on right now. And we interviewed a freight forwarder, we interviewed a bunch of people for the preliminary parts of this research. And he was really lamenting that he can't take his clients out to dinner anymore, that he doesn't really know his clients. It's all done through digital arm's length um, uh, interaction. So he really is sad that it's become less personal from what his experience was over the last 20 years. In standards, like what was mentioned, all of you know, the standards in the legal regulatory are paramount. And in this industry, it's just across the world. And the UN has been really, as you probably know, has been really involved in trying to help with standard setting because it is such a global industry. So this is what we're trying to work on is this uh, type of relationship between the players and this marching from left to right in terms of intensification of their relationship from coordination to cooperation, collaboration to interdependence. And what we think is really fascinating is this mutualism where there's a lot of back and forth because it's like supply chain so far in this, in the trade flows that trade lens represents. It's been kind of unidirectional, if you will, kind of additive in the, in the interdependencies. And so there's been a lot of speed and quality improvement. And, you know, just to give you a sense that in 2020, Trade Lens reported that they had uh, processed over 14 million documents uh, involving over 30 million containers and 200 organizations. So that's a, that's a level of the experimentation that, that's gone on, but the payoffs are pretty unidirectional. It's the streamlining of a lot of the paperwork and the identification of where the containers are. And yet there's so much promise when you get to the port to build in a lot of IoT or AI and make the like port functioning much more effective. And so that's where a lot of companies are going now or government agencies. And the Port of Rotterdam is a great example. So the beauty of open strategy and when you start working in this arena is you can decouple value creation from value capture. So there might be great value creation like Google. You can just think of Google. You don't pay for the search engine. It's huge value to you to do the search. But of course, the revenue comes from the ads. So you're decoupling what you're doing from where the revenue is accruing. And so that is similar in that's what blockchain allows you to do here is that you streamline the handoff, if you will, along the supply chain. But all those data that you generate along the way, you can really monetize in other ways. Um, I've done work in open source software. There are a lot of different business models. You probably can't see this very well, but I'm happy to share um, the paper with you. It's this Chesbro and Apple Yard paper that we wrote in um 2007 around open strategy. And so just to jump, so they, so Trade Lens did use one of these um, approaches. The subscription is the business model that they're using now that you have different levels of per ocean container, what you can pay for in terms of the level of um, interaction. And what we really want to get to is the future direction is thinking about this mutualism bi-directional um, payoff that we are, you know, going from this ecosystem 1.0 to this more platform ecosystem that is emerging in a lot of the blockchain enabled industries and trying to think how the other 4.0 technologies like AI, IoT, big data analytics will feed into the potential for new and improved business models. And as this is happening before our eyes, I said, like in the port of LA, and the Port of Rotterdam, They're a long time coming, you might laugh until you experience in COVID that they wouldn't know the ETA, the estimated time of arrival of containers. And so this has been wonderful in terms of the improvement of that um, knowledge <laughs> through IoT sensors. And then um, AL, AI algorithms can really help track the vessels and the trade routes. And then at the port, 
this is where the environmental payoff is you can optimize birthing time. And so you're really, you're not um, wasting the fuel uh, really lingering out in the hinterlands before you get into the port. So the bottom line is how COVID broke supply chains and then how AI and blockchain could fix them. So thank you very much. Um, Melissa, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much for your presentation. That was an incredibly uh, dense, deep, and uh, insightful presentation. So thank you very much. I'd have a lot of things to say, but I'm going to try to keep it uh, relatively uh, short. I really like how you, you started your, your talk about referring to the uh, pandemic and the COVID crisis that has uh, created, as we all know, some... Uh, frictions along, uh, along supply chains at the global level and how blockchain as a technology can help us actually uh, understand and track, keep track of uh, how or where these uh, flows of, you know, of goods and services uh, throughout the world. And that was very, very uh, convincing. My actual question to you is both going to be a, a comment and a question at the same time. Uh, listening to your uh your research program, but also your epistemological approach to, to everything that you are uh, uh, dealing with, it seems to me that your actual research program is a perfect uh, opportunity to introduce more uh, interdisciplinarity in, in blockchain research. I heard you, you mentioned at some time, what kind of frameworks are we going to mobilize in order to understand these uh, interdependencies. And I think one slide you mentioned uh, economics, transaction cost theory. Maybe we're also going to refer to uh, uh, networks uh, theory or systems theory or uh, you name it, social media or everything. So everything that is going to help us understand, uh, understand sorry, these uh, interdependencies a bit better. So my question is actually, but I think I can guess what your answer is going to be. Do you think we are here heading towards more uh, interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity in blockchain research with this kind of uh, fascinating uh, research program that you are bringing uh, forward today? Yeah, thank you, Mark. I, I love that question. I think that, yeah, there's no doubt that that convergence has really been precipitated by not only, like, like I didn't even talk about any of the technical issues because a lot of my engineering colleagues um, have already solved a lot of the interaction issues around like different blockchains, et cetera. It's really trying to think uh, the um, the true like value creation, value capture level. And that requires a lot of different disciplines to define what that looks like, especially like, you know, what was really the philosophy, the sociology that was alluded to in the previous presentation that there are huge human issues as far as the re-engineering of relationships, uh, in addition to the uh, parallel with the integration of technologies. And so it really is an interdisciplinary play right now. And I think the World Economic Forum has done a really good job, I'm, I'm sure, and your journal has done an excellent job of trying to bring in that interdisciplinary view of what's going on in blockchain because there's such a social component and such a technological component. So there's no way back. I, I'm totally in agreement with you. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was a fantastic presentation once again. I'm sure I'll... I'll uh listeners and uh, participants to this session would agree with me. Uh, so Mark, now I'd like to... Uh, we have time because of the time. We have time for other questions? Yeah. Okay, so let's take some other questions. No, 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 no Mark. I'm saying we don't have time for more questions. I'm saying we need to move oh, on. Oh, I don't have time. Sorry, I misunderstood. Okay, so we're going to move to our fourth and last presenter today. Danielle, uh, <laughs> are you with us? Already? Danielle is somebody I... I uh, have had some interactions with in the past. I remember uh, being in uh, in Denver in Scotland two years ago, just a few days before the, not the beginning of the pandemic, but the beginning of the, the lockdowns throughout Europe. So I'm very happy that we are in the same session today. Danielle, uh, the, the floor, I'm going to give you the floor. I'm going to ask you very shortly to introduce yourself and then talk about, uh, it seems, uh, enabling decentralized consensus genomics uh, today. Danielle? Thank you very much, Mark, uh, Professor Mark. Um, I don't know, can, can you hear me well? Yes, very well, very well. Okay, sounds great. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to be here again to say hello to 
some colleagues as well. So my name is Daniel Uribe. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Genobank.io, and we've been working in the space of NFTs, uh, genomics, and privacy laws since 2018. And uh, today I would have, um, well, my, my, my background is in cybersecurity, uh, basically, and uh, also I've been specializing lately in bioinformatics and the convergence with, <laughs> with uh, privacy laws like GDPR, CCPA, uh, and the new ones uh, that are out there. So um, throughout this uh, presentation, I'd like to introduce um, what, what we are doing is, is the continuation of our last paper. Um, the, the lead author of this paper is uh, uh, Giselle Waters. Uh, I, I am presenting on her behalf, so I, I appreciate her uh, confidence and trust, hopefully. I, I do a, a good job. <laughs> um, so I don't know, uh, is this uh, changing uh, the, the the slides? Because... Uh, uh, is... No, it's not changing. It's still the first slide. It's still okay. the first one. Now it's changing. Now it's changing. Now it's changing. Okay. Changing. Okay. 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 I can see myself on this slide. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. So the the main idea is that this in this occasion, we, we present like what, what are we doing and what, what is the 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 the, uh, the new thing right uh, that we are doing so in 2020 uh, we had the honor to present uh, privacy laws genomic data and non fungible tokens and we we were uh, honored with an award in back in 2020 it was right before the pandemic uh, hit it hard in March 2020. And uh, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm here with <laughs> Professor Mark uh, uh, receiving the, 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 the award. So uh, it was literally the, the, the beginning. So in this paper, we just started the conversation, right? It was like proposing the NFTs to represent ownership, authenticity, uh, proof, proof of, um, of consent, right, over, over genetic data. Our idea has always been to present this as an alternative to uh, store the, the will of the patients. And obviously NFTs provide some of the functionalities and that's why we partner that same year, a little bit later with William and Triken. Um, this young man, which I am standing next to him, uh, now I consider him my friend, um, we started the conversation because he, he's the lead author of the ERC721, as you may know, is the most popular smart contract in the world for NFTs. So he's the lead author. He, cre he helped create it with, uh, along with other um, talented uh, developers. So we started talking and we, we tried to design or, uh, or design a, a new variant of the ERC721 that will not transmit ownership. This is very important. Um, what we call as uh, biosample permission tokens with NFTs or bio NFTs, right? This we are introducing now the, 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 the concept of bio NFTs. Never transmit ownerships in terms of the smart contract. Is more think about like a permittee permitter uh, slash permitter concept where the patients uh, issue a, a NFT a permission to use their biological sample and its corresponding data in research uh, that, that is referenced within the, the, the smart contract, the, the, the metadata. And it, it is based or inspired in, in basically in GDPR uh, to, to trace permissions over a public blockchain. So basically, this is the problem we're trying to help solve. Um, like, for instance, some of you may know that the family of Henrietta Lacks is suing Thermo Fisher because um, not, they, they're, they're, her, her tissues are still being used in, in, in research, which is uh, net positive. But the problem is that there is lack of equitable tracing of, of her tissue. So the family, because unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Henrietta Lacks obviously died in 1951, a uh, victim of cervical cancer, as, as you may know, it's where the, Sila, the HeLa cells uh, as, as, a, as a cell line was, was uh, born. 
So the problem is that biosamples and corresponding data is used and accessed without transparency or without full transparency, traceability, and permission of, uh, from the data owner. Uh, so we, we think that the NFTs can help, or bio-NFTs can, can help to do that. And we, we, it's a concept that is still, uh, it's a broad concept, but we think it, it, can, it can help uh, solve. The other problem that there is, is um, it's not a monetization because a lot of people say, hey, uh, now I'll be able to tokenize my, my DNA data and then sell it. We are not um, trying to do that. We, we respect uh, all the, 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 you know, the potential um, use cases, but mainly for, for us is asymmetry of knowledge and decision power and transparency, right? So we, we think that the patient needs to have their own information or access to the informed information so they they, they can make, uh, they have the, the, the choice, the knowledge of what's going on with their biology, if it's related to a disease, and then have the power of decision in their hands with privacy, right? So our research continues, we are proposing Bio NFTs to enable an end to end genomics decentralized governance. The, the big question here is if, if we should create a decentralized sentinel system that even includes the sequencing laboratories or the bioinformatics uh, aspect toward a more transparent, ethical, uh, unethical human biosample chain of custody for commercial and research purposes. Uh, so the question right now is what, what everybody thinks? What, what do you think? about it. In the meantime, uh, we think yes, obviously, uh, we think that that is necessarily even at the level of the sequencing laboratories. Is, is, uh, is my genome, is my DNA being sequenced at a laboratory? And if the question is yes, I want to know, I have the right to know. So we're proposing the use of NFTs and privacy preserving Bloom filter with a collaboration of Professor Bill Buchanan to establish a system where with only 96 SNPs, I mean, it's this really, really tiny um, uh, portion of our genome. Uh, let's remember our genome is uh, 3 billion uh, bases. And, and from those 3 billion bases, we, we have uh, approximately 5 million uh, differences, right? So from those 5 million variants or differences, we are only proposing to use 96 uh, because with 96 is more than enough uh, information to discriminate an individual uh, with almost, uh, I mean, with, with 99.59 precision, right? Or even six. So at the end of the day, we want to check if once the, the sample is processed in the, in the bioinformatics uh, 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 process, we, we can check if now our information has the corresponding consent, right? We still uh, are, are uh, uh, procuring the privacy of the patient because with 96 SNPs, almost no information from, from the patient can be obtained, except that uh, you can search for the corresponding uh, permission. And so think about this. Uh, this is the other part. This is the Bloom filter. Uh, that we are proposing with the collaboration of, of Professor Bill Buchanan from Edinburgh Napier University. So he's helping us to design a bloom filter that could be an enabler for kind of, or think about the Shazam for genomics, right? This application that you just play five seconds of a song and it'll tell you what is the name of the song. Uh, the same we're kind of thinking about using bloom filters. Bloom filters will enable, will, will enable to search on, um, on, on different databases um, but, and, and, and in, a, in, a, in a privacy preserving way. So you can respect companies, let's say, or researchers databases, and you can still uh, respect the, 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 the patient's privacy as well. So the, the idea is in general, this is the last slide, um, the, to, to introduce the idea of how can we uh, create a patient-centered bio NFTs, uh, so we can use the blockchain technology to establish or, or to verify 
which uh, biosamples have been properly uh, con be, uh, being authorized by, by its uh, corresponding uh, data owner. And th these, these uh, bio NFTs are revocable by the, by the donor. And, and I, we think that this could help to build ethical DAOs or decentralized autonomous organization in life sciences and to train AI in research. And we think this might be the centerpiece to integrate with uh, every, every stakeholder that uh, has, has, to, has to touch any human biosample. Uh, we think this, the, the, the data owner needs or has the right to, to know if their biospecimens are being used um, and, 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 in, in a, and can be uh, enforced uh, uh, digitally in a, in a public blockchain. So th thank you very much. This is like uh, uh, the, the, the scope of the research. Uh, we, we are still in research to, to uh, um, try to, to implement this, um, but, but thank you very much, and especially to Giselle Waters uh, and, and, and Professor, yeah, that's him. Um, Daniel, thank you so much for your presentation. I can see that your research program is actually uh, thriving. Uh, you know, since we last met two years ago in uh, Scotland, I can see that uh, it's really going in the right uh, direction with a lot of uh, very, very insightful uh, uh, ideas and, uh, and uh, scientific uh, developments. I can see that uh, Dr. Murid is here. Do, do I have time for a question or not? I mean, because I know it's very tight. This yeah, one quick question. Tight. One quick question. Okay, uh, okay to, to Daniel, uh, because what you're talking about is so interesting, you know, and I can see the, the link with the digital identity, NFTs, or everything that, you know, the other presenters have, uh, have covered. Now, in terms of genomics and blockchain research, uh, do you think there's really room for improvement today in uh, higher education and research to put these really issues uh, to the fore so that people, more people, more decision makers, more regulators become aware of the importance of these uh, these issues, this uh, very fundamental topic that is going to be shaping our future more or less. So no. about higher education and research, do you think it has acquired the importance that it deserves or, or it's still in the process of getting there? Um, no, we, we think um, we, we, we hear more and more uh, researchers uh, coming into the space, like saying, hey, how can transparency help us to, um, to reach more patients? Because at the end of the day, that's the objective of researcher, right? Reaching more patients and, and at the same time, uh, taking care of their privacy or taking care of their, of their right to privacy. Um, there's, there's also an incentive that corresponds obviously to sanctions right now uh, the privacy laws has um, many economic incentives to 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 follow them and that is also part of the budget in terms of, of data protection right uh, or, or or liability so we we think that blockchain can also lower the cost to comply with data regulations and transparency should should uh, uh, help protect uh, all the stakeholders so in that case the conversation is really, really interesting. We 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 are contacted by many, many um, clinical laboratories, genetic testing companies, and and researchers in order to to have uh, an approach and start piloting the 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 cryptographic consents as as NFTs per biosample. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, so I'm gonna close this session. That was really a great presentation. Fantastic. Thank you. I can see Nassim is here. I would like to thank the four of you. Even our first presenter has left. All, all our li uh, listeners, participants to this session. It was really my uh, my honor, my pleasure to to moderate to chair this session today. Um, Dr. Nassim, would you like to uh, add anything? Have you enjoyed as much as I have this uh, very uh, brilliant session that we've. Uh, Excellent today. presentations. No, excellent presentations. <laughs> Very good, everybody. So, uh, Mark, please do uh, send us the scores via email. And yes. uh, we have a short coffee break. And then uh, we have Dr. Pierre Vigilance from Equidium Health at 3.30. Uh, so a short coffee break, and then we'll be back at 3.30. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We'll close the session now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.